This is a program that discusses issues of faith for people looking for answers. This is Viewpoint with Bob Placey. Last week, we introduced you to Nick Slatton, who served his country in the Army. Following his tours in Iraq, he joined Blackwater Security Consulting. In 2007, he was involved in what the media calls the Nisser Square Massacre. We're expecting to have to go out and recover a vehicle that has been hit by a car bomb. So we're expecting to have to go again, rego recover our brother's remains. And within a minute of being in that circle, we started receiving incoming fire, started receiving rounds onto the side of our vehicle, and then um, firefight broke out. He said, be on the lookout for a white Kia. Is that correct? Yes. You don't know if this guy is just not paying attention or if this guy is actually a car bomber. That's why that car was, was neutralized, why those people were killed. That's the tragic thing is they were two innocent people that did get killed that day. This is started in 2009. It's dismissed. They said they admitted that they had weak evidence against me. And that was 14 counts of manslaughter and 24 counts of attempted manslaughter, I think was the charge at the time. So, with, Yeah, with no they, bodies, no bodies. And they didn't have enough evidence to indict me, is what the judge ruled. So they told me that if I could waive my constitutional rights to a statute of limitation, or they were going to up the charge first degree murder. Eventually this gets to the point where you guys are found guilty. The jury comes out, they read your your verdict first. What was that like? I had already come to peace with it. I knew that I knew they were gonna find me guilty, so it was just, I was just numb. We now pick up with Nick's incredible story of being convicted and imprisoned as a political pawn and his incredible story of redemption which only God could orchestrate. Now, when they come to the, uh, where they're going to do the sentencing, the other three guys got, what, 30 years? Yes. For manslaughter? Uh, you got life. So you get, to, you get to prison when, I mean, they sent you out to a couple of regional jails first before they sent you to, uh, to Florida? Yes, sir. What would you do? I mean, all of a sudden you say, this is the rest of my life. What did you do? So I did what we were in trouble, and... Uh, we call out to God, right? So it was the first time I had returned to him with my whole heart. I was a little kid. And he answered me. And he basically just told me that I was in there for a reason. I was suffering for a reason. You know, I was basically feeling sorry for myself and asking him what to do. And he just put it on my heart through the scripture that it love God and love your neighbor. So I really spent a lot of time in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. I would read those over and over again, you know, as much as I could about what Jesus did. And then uh, it was all about helping people. It was all about loving people. And so while I was in prison and while I was in jail, I would just focus on other people's problems. Uh, there was there. There was a focus, though, at the same time that, I mean, we, we mentioned a guy named Jeremy Ridgway who actually flipped on you guys. He, he became a, a witness for the prosecution and, and just cooked up a story that, that they told him. I mean, he flipped his story a couple times, changed it. Uh, so you guys would have had a lot of reason to, to hate this guy. Tell me what God told you about Jeremy Ridgway. So, you know, God says that I am the vine. Jesus is the branches. We're the branches off of Jesus, right? Jesus is the vine. We're the branches. If we abide in him, we will bear fruit, right? But if we don't, we're going to wither. And so that's what I was doing. Basically, I was like, I've got this. Like, I was holding on to this grudge, so I was withering, you know, in my spirit. And God just put it on my heart one night that you have to love and forgive him. And so I'm laying there till 3 in the morning arguing with God, basically, <laughs> that I can't do that. You know, he lied, put me away for life. And the the guy, I'm not going to mention his name because I'm not going to drop names. It, it was not Ridgeway, but it was a, a, a different guy. And he, uh, he lied. And finally, I was just like, all right, God, you're God. I'm not. I love him. I forgive him. And the very next day, the military leaked documents 
probably classified, but they proved that he was lying. And so that opened a whole can of worms because this was after my third trial, you know, mm-hmm. and so they would have had to do a fourth trial and then thank God, you know, president Trump stepped in and, and let my brothers and I go. Yeah. Well, you were, you were at, th- at that time, were you in, in prison in Florida? When, when that happened, no, I was in a regional jail. So my time in prison, my time in prison was almost three years while we were waiting for our direct appeal to get finished. So after you're convicted, you get to appeal your conviction. And so the good Lord blessed me and I won completely, but because it was so political, they weren't going to just throw it out altogether. They gave the government a chance to retry me. So they ended up retrying me for a second time, which $10 million worth of lawyers came on my case for free because they believed in my innocence. And it was a wow. huge law firm out of DC and they crushed the government. So that, <laughs> that jury hung. So some of them wanted to convict me and some of them didn't. And then the third time they lied and hid evidence again, basically changed their story from the second trial to the third trial. But before the third trial, my lawyers, after the hung jury, they're like, look, will you take a polygraph? And I said, absolutely. And so they hired a guy that had recently retired. He was the lead polygraph examiner for the FBI Washington, D.C. field office. So he's like the tippy top dude at giving polygraphs. And he comes in this little jail. He's got his own contracting company. And he's basically like, look, son. I've been doing this for a long time. I'm going to know if you're lying. And I'm like, I didn't do it. Like, you can ask me any way you want to ask me. I did not do this. And then at the end of it, he's like, I'm so sorry. You didn't do this. (laughs) So as soon as we filed filed that motion with the court, the government comes to me with a deal. And they're basically like, I had four years and some change in by then. They're basically like, we'll give you five years. So that's, Basically, them saying, if you will plead guilty, you can just walk right out the door. So they basically offered me time served to plead guilty before my third trial or take a chance. And if you get found guilty, you get life in prison again. But you weren't about to to plead to say that you were guilty. You're not. I mean, you knew you were innocent and you weren't about to about to uh, take a guilty plea, were you? God wouldn't honor it. Like, I just knew that. I knew he would deliver me. I just always knew that he would get me out of it. I had faith, you know, that, you know. Yeah. Well, tell me, tell me about the, I mean, Psalm 91 is a, is a powerful psalm for you. Tell me why. Yeah, I started reading that while I was locked up, and it, um, it just fit with what was going on in my situation. And there was one particular time that a riot broke out in one of these little jails, the prisoners, they broke the sprinklers, they set the microwaves on fire, and they ran one of the guards out of the unit. So basically the prisoners had control of the unit for about an hour, maybe two hours. And so I just went to my cell, I sat on my bunk, I started reading my Bible, and my friend, he saw that I had went inside my cell, he came by and shut my door. And so in that little jail, when your door shut, it's electronically locked. So you can't get out. Nobody can get in. So my cellmate who's caught out in the riot, he can't get back in the cell. And so the riot team comes in with their flashbang grenades and their tear gas canisters and their riot shields. And they drag all the guys out that were participating in it. So needless to say, they weren't too happy with us. And for about seven days, they starved us. They uh, brought us styrofoam trays. That way it looked good for the cameras, but inside the styrofoam tray, there was literally like this much food, like two little bites of food. So we were hungry. And uh, I would read Psalms 91 first thing every morning. And what one morning after about four days of very little food, I'm reading it and I get to verse three. I had the NIV and it said, surely he will save you from the fowler snare. And I was like, that is where I'm at. When are you going to do it? You say, surely you're going to do it. When are you going to do it? 
And then I hear, and I had never heard God speak to me before audibly. I'd heard him in my heart, you know, mm-hmm. and I'd, I'd heard him, you know, in my head, but never an audible voice. So I think I'm going crazy. I hear Slatten, pack your stuff. You got a presidential pardon. So I'm like, yeah, I haven't had enough to eat, whatever. <laughs> so they let us out like a few days after that. And I get on the phone, call my sister, and she said, Nick, have you talked to anyone? And I said, no. She said, well, the New York Times reported that President Trump is considering pardoning soldiers accused of war crimes, and it mentioned you by name. And it was the mm-hmm. same day that I heard the voice. And now this was a year and a half before the pardon actually happened. So from that day forward, I was telling everybody, I was like, God told me I'm going to get pardoned, you know. I'm getting out. <laughs> and so I'm sure a lot of people were like, yeah, this guy's crazy, but... <laughs> One of my buddies actually got to hear that testimony and then see me leave. So that was really cool. He like hear me say that, yeah, God told me and yeah. I believe he's going to do it, you know, and, uh, and he did it. Yeah, it was so, amazing. I mean, you knew it was going to happen and God, God told you, he confirmed it. He, uh, the day that it happened, uh, tell me about that. Yes. The day that, that Trump pardoned you guys. So we knew about a week in advance. Um, Pete Hague says really advocated for us. And so the mm-hmm. president told Pete that he could go ahead and let the families know he was going to do it. And something happened, some kind of bill or something that slowed it up for that week. So he didn't do it until the next week. So the family was kind of sweating. You know, they're like, oh, is he really going to do it? Mm-hmm. And then uh, I just got a note under my door, a prisoner. He had read a news feed. They had tablets in that little jail that I was at that you could rent to check the news or sports or whatever. And he slid a uh, note under the door and it said four Blackwater contractors pardoned by president Trump. And then uh, my buddies were like yelling. They're like, dude, you just got pardoned by the president. (laughs) Now that is that a full pardon? Does that take away the the felony conviction and everything? I mean, it's as if it never happened. It's like it never happened. You full and unconditional, full and unconditional pardon means you get all your rights back. Yeah. You're a full citizen again. We'll return with more of Nick Slatton's incredible story of freedom after being accused of crimes he claims he didn't commit. Viewpoint is hitting more topics head on than ever this year. Every Viewpoint program is produced without any commercial advertising, but we couldn't do this show without the support of our financial partners, and it only takes a minute to give. Go to WTLW.com and click Get Involved, then Donate. Your gift of 20, 50, or even $100 will help continue the outreach of TV44's Viewpoint program to impact your hometown and the world. Would you like to help expand the reach of Viewpoint with Bob Placey? Then sign in with your YouTube account and subscribe. Do the same on your favorite podcast app. By subscribing, rating, and sharing Viewpoint content, you will help this life-changing media show up on more search engines as popular and trending. If everyone watching right now would do that, Viewpoint would become more visible worldwide to online viewers in places that missionaries can't even reach. Thank you for helping us reach the world by sharing Viewpoint with Bob Lacey. We now return to my interview with Nick Slatton, and stay tuned. We want to share more about others just like Nick who are awaiting freedom in American prisons after becoming political pawns. The media went, went nuts again. They went hysterical. I mean, if you look at some of the, whether it's ABC, CBS, CNN, they're saying Trump has pardoned four Blackwater contractors. They were, they were you know, they're, they're murderers. They did this massacre. They bring the, bring the whole story up all over again. Uh, what do you say to people like that? The people that would believe that? Well, I would just say that the people that write stuff like that have never had to get shot at, and they've never had to drag their buddies out of a burning vehicle. They've never had to recover their buddies' remains. So I think that a lot of it is just people not understanding what war is really like, and that mm-hmm. there is a lot of gray area in war, that it's not just black and white, like we talk about. You know, civilians on the battlefield, it's tragic anytime civilians are on the battlefield. But as we see in the current events, they're they're on the battlefield. You know, things that are going on right now in Ukraine, it's like 
there are civilians and they're having to fight. You know, and it's just, and it's just sad. You know, war is terrible, and uh, all we can do is keep our eyes on Jesus. That's all we can do. The other thing, Nick, is that uh, if if people just believe what they're told on the on on television, and they don't check out facts. Uh, like go to the, the, the trial transcripts, they're going to believe what they're told, and they still believe that uh, somehow you guys, got, you guys got off with murder. But uh, there are people that did believe in you. I mean, your sister's an attorney. I mean, you've got... Uh, there was a young lady that used to uh, ask if she could write you as a, as a pen pal when you were... Was it when you were in Florida? It was when I first got locked up. I still was in Virginia. So I was, oh, okay. Yeah. This this is a girl from your hometown that uh, uh, just wanted to be wanted to have you as a pen pal, right? Yes, sir. What happened? <laughs> so I had been locked up for about six months. That's about how long it takes for them to sentence you. So it was big news all over. So it was really big news in the little town that I live in. So I'm front page on the paper, sentenced to life in prison. And uh, so immediately, like a grassroots. Free Raven 23 started. Gina Keating was really behind that. Mm -hmm. And our families were really behind that. And so uh, this woman named Whitney started writing me. I had been crying to God, you know, and complaining. I was like, man, I'm getting old. I don't have a wife. I've got a life sentence. Uh, like, I, I've really messed up my life. I should have got married and had kids. And then I got a big stack of mail for Christmas. And... As soon as I touched the letter, God put it on my heart. This is your wife. And so really? I opened the letter. I was like, I don't know the <laughs> chick, you know. So I, I'm reading the letter, and she's just basically mm -hmm. like you said, you know, I'll be your friend. I believe you're innocent. Mm -hmm. If you want to write me, write me back. And so that's how it started. Then she started coming in and visiting me. Got moved to Florida. She would fly down there and visit me. And she just, wow. you know, she rode by me the whole time. And then the good Lord blessed me, and I she said yes when I asked her to marry me when I got out, and we got a, you know, a five-month-old baby girl. So life is good. Hey, life is life is good at that point. You mentioned uh, you mentioned some people. Uh, Gina Keating, she got involved in your story. Uh, what after? I mean, in the middle of the trials, didn't it? Or did she get involved after the sentencing? We had already been convicted. Okay, so she get here's a. And she describes herself as a, uh, she voted for Obama. She's a Democrat. She's very, very liberal. But she, uh, her, I think her boyfriend showed her some information on the, on, on the case and said she's an investigative reporter, normally doing consumer stuff. And, she, and he said, you need to look at this. You need to get involved in it. And she really dug into it, didn't she? She did. What, what, what happened as she, as she started to uncover things? So it really made her mad the amount of, Brady violations and the constitutional violations that, that the government was allowed to get away with. So she did what was called Raven 2-3 Presumption of Guilt. She started a podcast and basically she just went through every trial transcript and found everything that the government got away with that they shouldn't have been able to get away with. And she kind of, she tracked down those State Department cables about the Exxon Mole mobile contracts that they were worried were going to get you know she really investigated it she's the only one that has really just dug into it and read every single transcript so she is awesome well she's the one that uh, originally named you guys the biden four didn't she actually clint lawrence did that okay yeah he did um uh, there was a lot of talk about, you know, we were Raven 2-3 forever, but because mm -hmm. the rivalry between President Trump and Biden, you know, we thought that, Clint thought that would get his attention more, you know, the Biden 4, because, and we had the clip of him going to Iraq and talking right. bad about us. He didn't even know mm -hmm. the name of the, of the place where the event was supposedly no. took place. Mr. Square. Wrong, so. So you had some people behind you at that time, and uh, we want to give give some of that information out. Uh, right now, you, uh, people could go to supportraven23.com, right, to get, get a lot of the story? Yes, sir. And uh, you can go as well to, we're going to talk about this later, but freecalvingibbs.com. He's, he's yeah, and, that I'm really advocating for right now. 
Yeah, we want to talk about that as well. But uh, also, uh, Gen- Gina Keating's uh, podcast is on Think Again. It's also on YouTube, and you can get that, and it's uh, Raven 23 Presumption of Guilt. It's a long series of, of podcasts, but if you want all the information, uh, go there and, and you'll get that. Also, with a, a little bit of a, of a warning here, go to the Sean Ryan Show on, uh, on, on YouTube. It's called Sean Ryan Show. It's on Vigilance Elite, and it's his, uh, uh, I think it's episode 11. Yes. Is that right? Episode 11. And at that point, uh, you'll see all four of you guys tell the truth, tell the story to Sean. It's about a five-hour show because there's a lot of detail that, that uh, today we didn't have time to get into, but a lot of detail there that uh, you begin to see what, what can happen when you, you cross the government or they can use you as a pawn in something like the Iraqi elections and the mobile Exxon oil leases. All of a sudden, they need a victory and uh, they take it out on four guys. Uh, you'd mentioned Calvin, and I want to talk about that for a minute, because part of when you came out of prison and, and uh, uh, coming back from Iraq originally, you said you were a mess, but now coming out of prison, you've got a, a new wife, a baby, but at the same time, you've got a big cause. Tell me about that. Yeah, God really laid it on my heart that I was suffering for a reason, and I found out about Staff Sergeant Calvin Gibbs. He's currently sitting in Leavenworth, serving a life sentence in prison as well. The thing that immediately drew me to Calvin Gibbs was the fact that he refused to plead guilty, same as me. They offered him lesser time if he would plead guilty. Um, Another thing that's very interesting about Calvin's trial, if you want to call it that, was he was a member of the 2nd Infantry Division. He was a squad leader. And he had been charged with three counts of murder, premeditated murder. So when they're picking his jury, they're at a division that is full of infantrymen, right? There was not one combat infantryman on Calvin Gibbs' jury. So he's being judged for actions in combat by people who have never been to combat. So that was... uh, a big eye opener to me that this guy really got thrown under the bus. And so, like I said, he's charged with three different murders. One of the alleged murders, he wasn't even at the scene. The second one, there was exculpatory information that showed that he was getting shot at. Another soldier was willing to testify that yes, they were taking fire. They threatened that soldier with prosecution. After Gibbs' trial, they just dismissed the case against the soldier in exchange for his silence during Gibbs' trial. And then the third body, Gibbs was not at that scene either. So you've got two bodies that he's not even at the scene. They're 300 yards away on the other side of the village when it happens. So how can that be premeditated murder? And then especially when somebody is shooting at you, how can that be? That's self-defense, right? So it is. it's sad that there's over 5,000 members of the Taliban that have been released from prison while soldiers, warriors like Calvin Gibbs sit locked up as prisoners of war in their own country. And people mm-hmm. don't even know Calvin Gibbs' name. And so I appreciate you letting me say his name on your program. Um, call your congressman, your local, and your federal your state and your federal congressman, your state and your federal senator, and ask them about post-war amnesty. Ask them about getting these guys out. You know, these guys are all the time programming. The recidivism rate is zero. When they leave a military prison, whatever they're doing in there, they're rehabilitating these guys. You don't have to worry about them. And the fact that Gibbs comes up for parole, right, He's got life with the possibility of parole. One of the conditions usually for parole is you have to admit fault. Admit. He refuses to admit fault. He says, I've made mistakes in combat, but I never murdered anyone. I never executed anyone. So he doesn't get parole. Again, that's freecalvingibbs.com, right? Yes, sir. 
Okay. And if you want more information, uh, supportraven23.com. You can also go to the, uh, 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 the Gina Keating podcast on uh, Think Again. It's called uh, Raven 23, Presumption of Guilt. Or you can go to the Sean Ryan show that's on YouTube, and you'll, and you'll meet all four of these guys. Uh, Raven 23, you'll meet all four of them. Uh, telling the story from the beginning all the way through. I got to give you a little bit of warning on that. The language is pretty rough, but at the same time, it's, it's real life, it's raw, but it's the truth. Nick, when you look back, uh, your whole family had, uh, I mean, that, there was a history of service in your family. It was kind of almost expected. And that, kind of the same thing with the other guys is that uh, they were there to serve for their country. They were there to, to serve and, and protect the United States of America. Uh, you guys come out of all this, uh, if you were young enough and fit enough, would you, would you go back? Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, you got to remember the people that were against us, they were powerful people, but they just made up a small group in our government, right? So it was just a small little group that really wanted us. They had a lot of influence and they had a lot of money. You know, they had a lot of power, but if you look at it, our the way our government has broke up, it's very tribal as well. So there's really good parts of it, really essential parts of it, and then there's parts of it that that are abusing their power. So we just got to – you can't look at it as a whole entity. You know, you got to look at it in separate. And me, I love and forgive them all, the judge, the prosecutors, all of them. I gave it all to God, So and he's blessed me because of it. God gave you a timeout, and you accepted it as a timeout, and he changed your life. Oh, yeah, that's what any good father would do. If their son is acting up, you know, you're going to put him in timeout. You're going to set him down. You're going to be like, boy, you can't be doing that. And that, that's exactly what he did to me, you know. And I'm so stubborn that it took me getting slammed down for the rest of my life for me to submit, you know. I was basically like Jonah. I was just like, no, I'm not doing it. I know I'm supposed to do it, but I'm not doing it. And, and he got me. I want to thank Nick for taking the time to share his story. He did this under one request, that we would share the story of his other brothers in arms who are awaiting justice. One of those is Sergeant Calvin Gibbs. Cal's story is similar to Nick's as he was defending his life while under fire from a terrorist. He's since been serving life in prison at Leavenworth. His most recent appeal was denied, though many of our warriors have been granted post-war amnesty. Nick asked that you sign the amnesty resolution and send it to your state's leaders. We have the website listed below. And you may wonder why a show like Viewpoint would discuss a topic like this. Just like abortion or racism or any abuse of power, we as people of faith believe that justice comes from God, and we do have a right to shine a light on these stories when we're made aware of them. Join me again next week on Viewpoint. For more interviews on demand, plus additional resources from today's guests, go to WTLW.com and click on the Viewpoint tab. If you are enjoying Viewpoint, we would appreciate your financial gift so we can continue to produce more programs.